Good morning. The word of the Lord from Isaiah 43, 19, slightly paraphrased. <laughs> Don't worry about what was in the past. Don't focus on that. Behold, I do a new thing. Can you not perceive it? <laughs> what are we perceiving? So as we look through the history of the church, there have been times along the way where the church was beginning to lose its way because it was accommodating the world too much. And usually accommodating the world had something to do with money, uh, sometimes with sex and power, that Richard Foster's trio of things that get us off track, right? Money, power, control, collusion with military force in order to get what we want as the church. Uh, wanting to have the right to boss everybody around and make them do what we want. Acting like we own the joint. <laughs> and every time the church collectively begins to get into that space, God brings forward, right up out of the ground almost, prophets, reformers, mystics, people that annoy the heck out of us. <laughs> so I've got a few pictures on the screen uh, coming up. On the one side, Benedict of Nursia, 400s, Benedict emerges, he begins to form communities, intentional communities, and form a rule of life, a, a, a common set of spiritual practices that people could follow in order to practice focused discipleship for the sake of the world, for the sake of God's church in the world. And so he formed this network of communities, and you know, it's not easy work doing this kind of ministry, intentional community. Uh, along the way, one of the things that happened was uh, the community members got together and had a plot to poison him. <laughs> so, yeah, this kind of work's not always easy. It's not smooth, and it's easy to romanticize it. So we have Benedict, and you know, today, people still follow the Benedictine rule. I'll bet some of you might be Benedictine oblates. Is that true? Have you heard of that before? Yes, it, it's, it's a rule of life known for its sanity, <laughs> for its uh, humane quality, for its livability by ordinary people. If you go back to that slide again, I'll show that. There we go, yeah. So then the next one over, uh, the Beguines and the Begards, in the German, well, the, the Northern European lowlands, which would be Holland and that area today, a group of, Lay women got together and uh, they decided, this was around 1100, they got together and they decided they were going to live in intentional communities in an unauthorized way. Okay. So they didn't ask anybody's permission. Do you know you don't have to have anybody's permission to invite your neighbors to eat dinner with you regularly Amen. and pray? Amen. You can just go off and rebelliously do this. Oh. <laughs> You can do neighborhood hospitality. So the, the, at first it was women, and they, they were the Beguines, and they formed households. They didn't take vows of permanency. They weren't like the Benedictines who take a vow of stability where they're gonna stay in the same place and they're gonna be living in community with the same people to the end of their days. Instead, they formed, uh, they, would, they would rent houses. In some cases, somebody would own a house, and they would locate themselves in the parts of the city where people were in terrible need. And they would give themselves to their neighbors. Is this beginning to sound familiar? Remember yesterday about the Celts? And these women would live in community. They would tend the sick. They would help with education. They would make sure their neighbors had something to eat. They, they were not asking for a handout. It wasn't all about them. It was about kenosis, giving themselves away and they became very popular. They also got in trouble because they hadn't asked permission to do these things. <laughs> you can tell when, when, when the church is so uptight about permission that you have to give permission to people to be hospitable to their neighbors. That's a sure sign that the wheels are coming off the cart. <laughs> but these women persisted because God had called them. And before you know it, some men formed some communities like this. They were free to leave anytime they wanted to. So some of the women, they might be living there, working in this way for a few years, and then they decided to get married, and so they were able to go, and they were sent off with a blessing. It was kind of a loose structure. 
If I could look at that slide again, that would be helpful. Okay, now we have Martin Luther. I mentioned him yesterday. So Martin Luther comes along and the, the church is having trouble. It's again, uh, in his view, selling out, selling out to money, power, control. So he goes to the door of Wittenberg Castle. He nails a list of 95 complaints. I don't know, Bishop, if um, anybody has gone and nailed a list of complaints to the door of the conference office, but uh, sometimes people feel like that, right? I think maybe sometimes bishops feel that way too. Yeah, I've got some complaints of my own, yeah. And one of his complaints, one of his deep concerns was that people, ordinary people should have the Bible and read it and understand it for themselves. When we control the, the information flow, the knowledge flow, then you can control people, right? And so one of the things that was going on in the broader culture was the invention of the printing press, which made it possible now to publish the Bible. And translating the Bible into languages that people speak, this was just considered heretical by so many people, to translate the Bible in a language people could speak. And so this was part of the Protestant Reformation and unleashed a whole new uh, trajectory for the church. Then you go a couple hundred years later, you have John Wesley. John Wesley and his friends are in college. They form something called the Holy Club, which is just a terrible name. Don't do that. <laughs> no, call it the Journey Group or something like that. <laughs> the Holy Club, he and his friends, young, young adults, so often these reform movements start with young adults. What are we doing to foster the spirit of reform in our young adults? What are we doing in our youth ministry to call forth the Beguines, <laughs> to call forth the John Wesleys of our day? Are we thinking like that? So John Wesley forms this holy club and they want to, they want to start taking discipleship seriously. And as he's developing his ministry over time, it reminds me of AA. They form these ways of speaking to each other, like, hi, I'm John, and I'm a sinner. <laughs> well, John, what have, what have you done this week to search the scriptures? What have you done to go and be with poor people and help them? John, what have you done in prayer? What's God been saying to you? Hey, John, what kind of sin are you struggling with? It was like that, an accountability group. And so as the Methodist ministries got started and evolved over time and the class meetings formed over time, all this kind of, it was all very organic. The backbone of Methodism is this kind of accountable discipleship. Did you know that? It's not the clergy. <laughs> Our DNA is accountable discipleship, taking seriously our life of piety, that's old-fashioned language, <laughs> our life of prayer and devotion and commitment to God, and our life of action, taking seriously our inner, inner Mary and our inner Martha. <laughs> this is what it means to be an old-fashioned Methodist. So we have John Wesley. You move forward, and if we could go to the, uh, back to that same slide. In the 20th century, a woman named Dorothy Day, she'd had a checkered past. <laughs> she had a child out of wedlock and she had all kinds of issues and God called her. Do you know God calls some weird people to do things like this? <laughs> God might even be calling you <laughs> to do something like that. <laughs> really unlikely people. <laughs> So Dorothy Day was Catholic and she partnered up with a man named Peter Marin and they, they formed something called the Catholic Worker Movement. They started publishing a little newspaper, very concerned about people living in chronic poverty, very concerned about labor rights and all the issues of uh, cities that are in, in poverty. The Catholic Worker Movement is alive today. Are you beginning to see some themes here that are coming back around and around? And if we go next to the next slide, in the 20th century, in the 1940s, Clarence Jordan in Georgia with his wife form a community called Koinonia Farm. Have you heard of this? Koinonia Farm. And of course, this is in the 1940s uh, with uh, 
extreme uh, uh, racist activity going on in our nation and a war and all these kinds of things going on. And so they form an agricultural community in the deep south. And it's a community of reconciliation. It's the kind of community that Dr. Martin Luther King called a beloved community. With African Americans and white people and others living and working in community, growing food together and being a witness to a very divided nation. They suffered violence for being a beloved community. Do you know it takes great courage to be a pioneer and do the new thing that God is bringing forth? It is not easy. It is hard work. It requires prayer. Sometimes it requires blood. They were beaten for forming Koinonia Farm. Now, why would anybody want to beat up a group of people that are growing things in the ground? I'll tell you why. Because when we take discipleship seriously, when we begin to live in the way of Jesus instead of just talking about Jesus, we will see two things happen. On the one hand, we will see uh, the lame walk. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, people will be healed, people, uh, people raised from the dead. Right. Amazing miracles, signs and wonders. And on the other hand, we will be persecuted for what we're doing persecuted because the powers and principalities that infest our systems will not be still. And sadly, sometimes the persecution and the powers and the principalities come through our religious systems because we're doing a new thing. We're not looking to the past. We're, we're noticing when God says, behold, I do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? So to get involved in following Jesus and what Jesus is doing now, what Jesus is calling forth now, this is risky business. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be doing anything else. What about you? All right. I wouldn't. <laughs> Along about the same time Koinonia Farms started, another ministry started with Gordon and Elizabeth Cosby. Washington, D.C., Church of the Savior. You know that started out as a little home group, just very obscure, looked like it wasn't going to amount to anything. Uh, it looked like it was just a, just, a, just a bunch of little people sitting there drinking coffee and saying radical things about Jesus. <laughs> this is the way it always starts. Remember I told you yesterday about that, that peak? <laughs> People like Gordon Cosby start standing up and saying, we have to take discipleship a lot more seriously. And the critics all around from the same tradition, all esoteric, hippie weirdo stuff, didn't get them out to anything. This one's my favorite one. Not sustainable. Not sustainable. <laughs> Following the gospel is not sustainable. You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> That's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard. <laughs> Do you know why following the gospel is sustainable? It's because God calls us, God equips us, the Spirit fills us, and God is very persistent. <laughs> it is God's idea. <laughs> That's why it's sustainable. <laughs> so they formed this little group, and in time it became a, a different kind of church, Church of the Savior. And in its early days, and Church of the Savior is still going, and over the years they have morphed into different forms in order to respond to the needs of the time, because they have attempted to always listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church, and to not be too attached to one particular wineskin. The wineskin is not the gospel. It's not. Our hymnal is not God. Even the Bible, the Bible is not God. There, there's not a quartet in heaven with the Father, the Son, the Spirit, and the Bible. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I love the Bible. <laughs> but God speaks to us through the Bible. This is what John Wesley taught us. This is what we've learned through our experience. God speaks to us through the Bible. The Bible is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. Can you not perceive it? <laughs> It's so Church of the Savior did some odd things. They formed small groups that met around the different parts of the city, and they devoted themselves to their neighbors. Is this sounding familiar at all? 
One of my favorite books that has come out of that movement from the early days, Elizabeth O'Connor, Journey Inward, Journey Outward. Have you read that one? One of their most creative things that they did, well, two things that I'll just mention and then I've got to move on. So one of them was, if you wanted to join that church after a while as they were evolving, these things are always organic, they evolve. <laughs> they realized that many people who were coming into their fellowship were pretty messed up. They were like us. <laughs> came from dysfunctional families and had issues and things like that. And so if you wanted to join the church, which was a, another level into this concentric circle of commitment, so to step closer, you know, Christ, uh, the, the, the Holy Trinity is in the center, you step closer in commitment. So they wanted everybody who joined the church to go through therapy. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Can you imagine your church board if everybody went through therapy? Wouldn't that just be, be so helpful? <laughs> so very, very helpful. <laughs> yeah. So many people in our culture are, are bound by shame because of life experiences that have shamed them. And then that shame plays itself out everywhere, including on our church boards. The dysfunctional churches, it's, there's usually a shame root there. Well, I better not go down that rabbit trail. <laughs> the other thing I thought was very clever, uh, they noticed that a lot of their people that, and, and I'm saying a lot, this is not a giant mega church, okay, Church of the Savior. This is rigorous discipleship, which never attracts large numbers of people. <laughs> Unless you're CrossFit, and then you'll attract them. <laughs> so so. so they, they realized that they had a number of people that were trying to stop smoking because it was bad for their bodies and it was expensive. So they said to themselves, what can we do? Let's have cigarette retreats. And so uh, again, this is deeply contextualized. That's the thing I want you to hear. It's deeply contextualized. They're paying attention. They're showing up, they're paying attention. They're saying, how can we cooperate with God's healing work in this neighborhood with these people? So they had these cigarette retreats. They did some research and found that if you can go for 72 hours without smoking when, when you've been a smoker, then that's the tipping point where the craving starts to diminish. So they had 72-hour cigarette retreats and the smokers would get together and a few other people and they would do spiritual formation and they would eat and they would sing and do different things so they could get past the craving together. A type of accountable discipleship with a very specific need. Isn't that beautiful? I don't think they still do cigarette retreats. Maybe they do some other retreat. You move forward in the 20th century and more of these experiments start to happen. And in the last 15 years, something called the new monastic movement has appeared. It's emerged up out of the ground. <laughs> and Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove, you can go to the, uh, to the slide with the three people. There you go, there's Jonathan over on the one side. So Jonathan lives in Durham, North Carolina. He's a Duke alum. I met Jonathan 10 years ago when I was doing some research on new monastic movements. And uh, Jonathan is probably the best known writer about the new monastic movement. And so he and his uh, wife and children live in a, a community, live in an intentional community in a neighborhood called Walltown, which is a historic black neighborhood. It's uh, where the workers who built Duke University, there's a whole history of racism in that, uh, in that city. And so he's there, he's a part of St. John's Baptist Church, which is about two blocks from his house, and they've done all kinds of things. So this movement, this movement, and so the new monastic movement, of which I'm a part too, as a, as a Methodist, so again, this, this whole uh, calling forth by God to take seriously our discipleship for two reasons, for, well, for three reasons, for our own salvation. <laughs> One of the reasons that this is an important part of my life is so that I can be honest about how I'm living. My husband and our friends who are part of our community help me tell myself the truth about how I'm living. It's easy when you're in a public forum, I'm a dean or I'm here, to, to sound and look good, but it's the everyday stuff that, 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 that's where the rubber meets the road. And I need people who will pray with me every day. That's the main thing that I love about it, is I've got people that will pray with me 
every day. We do pray together. In the morning, we have our morning prayers as individuals. In the evening, we do corporate prayer. We gather after dinner. We cook for one another. We share the chores. We uh, help refugees in their resettlement together, and we do other things together. We have retreat at our house for all kinds of groups of people. But it's this sense that my discipleship, our discipleship, will be so much more honest if we tell each other the truth. This is very Wesleyan. <laughs> Did you know that they called John Wesley a closet Jesuit? <laughs> You closet Jesuit. <laughs> he had three, three general rules, right? Yeah. yeah, the general rules. I mean, this is all, it was a lay monastic movement, I'm telling you. Methodism, as it got started, was a lay monastic movement. Cultural, it was deep, deeply enculturated. It had to do with the local context, and as it spread around and came over to North America, it, it enculturated itself here. So as I've participated in this way of life for, uh, for, really for over a decade, and as I've gotten to know people who are leaders in this way of life, not only the new monastic movement, but in the missional church movement, uh, which is a, a stream of this emerging thing God is doing, the missional church movement comes to us. Uh, Leslie Newbegin, do you remember reading Leslie Newbegin in seminary back in the day? He's sort of the father, they consider the father of the missional church movement. And other, the other movements, uh, fresh expressions, there are other movements. So as I'm watching and listening and participating, I have some questions about the whole thing. If we can go to the new slide. What are the conditions, as we take the historic uh, sort of broad view, what are the conditions in which God breathed reform movements like this come up. What are the conditions? Well, war is usually a part of it. War destabilizes societies and causes a lot of fear and uncertainty. And so war, anything that destabilizes a society creates a condition where um, historically the church has tended to also be destabilized. And then you'll have people out of the, the, the deep anxiety of the destabilized environment. Out of the deep anxiety, we'll clutch at something, anything, to try to make things stable again. This is what we do when we have anxiety in our systems. And instead of getting at the root issue, we try to stop the anxiety. And that's when we behave badly. <laughs> that's when we burn people at the stake, and we shut this down, and we send that person over there, and we uh, sidle up at, uh, to the powers and the principalities to help us circle the wagons and get control again. So war, civil unrest, lynchings, <laughs> gather everybody up and put them in that concentration camp so they can't scare us anymore. Stereotyping whole groups of people. These conditions are the kind of conditions when God brings forth reformers who say to us, God is doing a new thing. Can you not perceive it? <laughs> Famine. Political upheaval. Coups. These are the conditions. So I ask you, look around. What are the conditions in which we find ourselves today? Are we, are we really that surprised that God is calling forth this new thing now in our day and time? So here we are, a bunch of United Methodist pastors and lay leaders and uh, other kinds of leaders who work in our beloved denomination that started out as a lay monastic movement. <laughs> and the question for us now is, how can we help our established inherited church make the shift, participate in the new thing that God is doing instead of trying to kill it? Pretty good question to sit with, isn't it? <laughs> How can we not kill what God is doing? <laughs> so here's a picture of a little church in Cornwall. Now a year and a half ago, I went uh, on a preaching and teaching tour through England and up into Scotland uh, for the British Methodist Church. And one of the things that I did was spend time in four regions of the UK 
with leaders of fresh expressions and pioneering uh, faith communities. It was so much fun. <laughs> it was great. And I'll talk about fresh expressions in a minute. So this little church is in Cornwall, and um, I, don't, I don't know if you've ever had an opportunity to be in Cornwall. It's just gorgeous. It's a part of England that's its own thing. It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like, uh, well, never mind. <laughs> It has its own culture that's been preserved in a very special way. It's beautiful and a wild, rugged landscape. Uh, amazing cliffs that drop down into the sea. Well, I had no idea, but it's a surfing destination. I didn't even know English people could surf. I mean, that was, you know. <laughs> I thought they just drank tea and ate crumpets. I didn't know. <laughs> but it's a surfing destination. Okay, so in Polzeth, where this little church is, little, little Methodist church, the church was dying. The church had about six or eight people in it, older people, really up in years. And they remembered when their sanctuary was full. It, it's just a little church, like, like most of your churches. Uh, they remembered when the sanctuary was full. And so on Sundays, they would be in the sanctuary. You saw that little building. And they would look down where the, I, I took the picture from the beach. And the beach is where all the surfers gather because that's great conditions for surfing right there. And they would look out there in the summertime and the beach was filled with people, families, individuals, surfers, people in wetsuits, uh, uh, people uh, having snacks and picnics. And they, would, and they were saying to each other, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get some of those people to come to church here? We're right here. We want to be the church for the surfer crowd. But there are no surfers interested in us. They don't even seem to see us. We're kind of invisible. So they finally got desperate enough in longing with God's heart to reach their neighbors who surf. And they said, we will do whatever it takes to be with the surfers and be the church that the surfers need. They shifted into missional ecclesiology. They stopped saying, how can we get the surfers to do what we want and come and be where we are and sing our songs and speak our language and wear our clothes and act like us? <laughs> they stopped saying that and they started saying, how can we go and be where the surfers are and incarnate the love of Jesus with the surfers? Now, you have to think how funny this is. I, I, think, I think God was just chuckling. <laughs> You've got seven older women who look like, you know, us older women. <laughs> How can we go and be with the surfers? <laughs> so here's what they did. They went radical. They hired two surfer dudes. <laughs> There's no such thing as a surfer man, they're dudes. <laughs> they hired two surf surfer dudes. One of them was a national champion uh, who had some theological training. Neither of them had masters of divinity degrees. But they were Christians, they loved Jesus. So this church hires them to come in and guide the church's transition so it could be the church for their neighbors, the church for others, the thing that Dietrich Bonhoeffer said we need to do, be the church for others. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said we are not the church unless we are the church for others. <laughs> we're something else. <laughs> and so they transitioned that church and I wish we had time uh, they took out the pews. I know that's just, that's just enough to give you a heart attack. <laughs> they took out the pews. <laughs> took them out. Put in some sofas. They took the foyer of the church and they turned it into a really nice little coffee, soup, and artisanal bread kind of place. Up in the chancel, that gated community where only the clergy can go. <laughs> Yeah, they gutted it, they gutted the chancel. <laughs> they put one of those half pipe things in, you know what I'm talking about? One of those things that go like that. And it's big, now it's big enough, and so now it's for, for, for kids on their skateboards, can go in there and do their little things. <laughs> kind of like the Holy Spirit dancing around in the chancel doing all these kind of things. <laughs> and the surfer dudes helped the congregation get its arms around what, it, what it's like to provide spiritual formation and to preach and to be the church for the surfer community. Do you know that church is thriving now? They gave it a new name. It's now called Tube Station. <laughs> tube Station. It's a surfer term. I don't know. 
So I visited there. The, the bottom part of that church building that used to, it used to, as one of my friends said, it used to smell like old hymnals and despair. <laughs> you know that basement. <laughs> It's that place in our church when anybody dies and their, and their children donate their stuff, you just put them in that room, close the door. <laughs> close that door, get that stuff out of here. <laughs> and you never ever open it until somebody else dies and you put their stuff in there too. They gutted that too. Turned it into a really nice art gallery for local artists. So they, they have... Uh, uh, they show their art, and they have special days for the artists, and that church has become a hub for that whole town. They have 200 people in worship regularly. I don't know where they put them all. I really don't. But that church is thriving. It's, it's the hub of the community now. In a country where the church is shrinking dr dramatically, tube station, they got desperate enough to stop looking back and to start noticing what God is doing. So yesterday, uh, we can go to the next slide. Yesterday I showed you this diagram of systems change and where the anxiety is. And, and we're gonna just look at that anxiety a little bit more right now because when we start doing things like creating that tube station, now you're not gonna create tube station in Akron, Ohio or somewhere, Toledo, right? <laughs> Why, because we're not a surfer community. <laughs> No, you do something that would be specific to that context. And we have to do a lot of community listening and community organizing and calling forth the strengths of the community, finding what God is already doing out there outside our walls. Did you know God's allowed to do stuff beyond the walls of our church? <laughs> That's very hard for us to hear. We're used to thinking that we own God. We own God. God is trapped in our buildings. God is trapped in our liturgy. We know better than everyone. That's why we have master's degrees. And we think this way. And we're going to have to start thinking like the Celts. <laughs> How is God already at work out there? God's at work in us. God's already at work out there. In Wesleyan terms, we call that prevenient grace. God's already at work out here in this neighborhood. How can the God in us join up with the God out there? <laughs> Same God. And how can we collaborate with what God is already doing? God's already been tilling the soil. God's already been setting the table and putting the kettle on out there. How can we go participate? So as we do this, the anxiety of change that's already in the system because of the decline uh, hits the anxiety of we don't know what's going on here. Where's this all going? Where's the money going to come from? A lot of worries about money. So many worries about money, you would think that it was a power or something. Mammon. Oh yeah, it is a power. It is a power that takes control of our thoughts, our hearts, our bodies. It controls our imagination about our vocation as Christians. Anxiety. So if you go to the next slide. See the little blue caterpillar? Those are, those are us leaders that are leading these institutions <laughs> that are going through change. We're the, we're the leaders that need to actually not focus too much on the past and to see the new thing that God is doing and to create blessing on both sides. Blessing. This is a very difficult place to be because we become the lightning rod for everyone's anxiety. The people who won't change, the people who want to change but don't know how, the people that are changing, the people that are leading the change, <laughs> everybody, because we're the leader. This is, what, this is the way that this, this works. And how are we going to withstand the pain of that anxiety? How are we going to function as godly people when all that anxiety is coming toward us and people are pulling in different directions, it's like we're in a crosshair. And how do we do that? 
Here's how we do it. We stay deeply grounded in Jesus Christ. Yeah. We have to pray. <laughs> we have to have a, a serious spiritual discipline. We might need therapy too. <laughs> Because every unhealed wound in your life that you have tried to put under the rug and not think about will come to the surface. Everybody will push every one of your buttons. All those people forming triangles and trying to get at that person through you, I know they don't do that in West Ohio. They only do that somewhere else. <laughs> All that stuff happens during this change. So as the system is changing and as we're leading and as we're listening to God day by day. We are like the people that are fleeing Egypt. Do you remember that story in Exodus? God didn't want God's people to be in bondage. That is never God's plan to be in bondage. That's, that's a devilish plan <laughs> for people to be in bondage. So God is leading uh, the Hebrew people out of Egypt and they have to cross the Red Sea. Do you remember this story? So they're all afraid and they're not sure and Moses and Aaron, they're trying to manage everything and it's not so easy, it's hard. There's a lot of anxiety. So what does God do? God says to them, all you've got to do is follow that pillar of fire by night and pillar of cloud by day. That's just, just watch for the pillar. So at night as they go to sleep, the last thing they see, they, they go into their tent, they lay down on their bedroll, the last thing they see before they fall asleep is the flicker of the fire on the outside, you know, like a campfire on your tent? You know what I'm talking about, that flicker of light? And they say to themselves, all is well, God is with us. We can sleep tonight. And so they sleep. They wake up in the morning, they jump up off the bedroll, or in my case, crawl out slowly. They open that tent flap and what the, what they step right out and they're looking for the cloud. Where's it going? Because that's where we're going. That's the mindset we need right now. That will deliver us of our anxiety. <laughs> go with God. <laughs> Where's God going? That's where we're gonna go. But in that slide, if you go back to that slide that we just looked at, see that little yellow circle? Does that look yellow on your screen? That's where the anxiety really peaks where it's maximum. So as the declining system is really beginning to bottom out and the new thing is really beginning to take off, right in that space, which can take quite a while, it can take many years, <laughs> that space is where it feels like chaos and confusion. Where's this thing going? We're not so sure there's a lot of fog. <laughs> We can't quite see the new thing that God is doing. We just know God is doing a new thing. And, and all of our unresolved issues of grief and anxiety from the past, from our family of origin and everything else, that's all getting tapped into by this systemic anxiety. And the, the loss of resources that used to work and the question marks about where the new resources will come from and even what kind of new resources we'll need, that's a lot of question marks. So that whole space where that yellow circle is feels like chaos and confusion and uncertainty. It's hard. So I think about this. Genesis chapter one, when God is creating the world, do you remember this? The spirit is hovering over the deeps, do you remember this? Ruach, hovering like a mother bird over the deeps. And the Hebrew phrase there is tohu vavohu which we translate in different ways in our English Bibles. Uh, we translated the void, the emptiness. We translate it in different ways. Uh, tohu vavohu means literally chaos and confusion. That's what it means. God's building blocks, God's playground of creativity is chaos and confusion. That's where God is. <laughs> That's where God who creates wonderful ordered life, God who creates butterflies and snakes and <laughs> people. <laughs> God created the world out of that stuff. Step by step and it resulted in ordered beautiful life, it resulted in worship. So as we find ourselves in this space, we don't have to freak out. <laughs> Let's decide not to, okay? 
Everybody that's willing to not freak out. It's about half the people, Bishop. <laughs> God is with us. God is not bound by our anxiety or our shrunken imaginations. <laughs> God is not bound by what happened with our coach when we were 14. God is not bound by that cranky person that wants to run the church like an alcoholic family. God is not bound. God is not bound by our very limited notions of what church is because our imagination has been shrinking. And so God is hard at work. God is very persistent, very persistent. And our questions are, how can we cooperate with that persistent God? Well, I've mentioned what the pastors and the other leaders need to do, lay leaders too. We have to be deeply grounded. So we need to return to cultivating a contemplative stance in life. What do I mean by that? We show up, we show up to God, we show up to ourselves, we show up to our neighbors, our context, we pay attention. What is going on? How am I experiencing life? What's going on in my stomach today? <laughs> the seat of my personhood, right? What's going on in there? What's going on when I read scripture today? We show up, we pay attention. We're, we're watching and we're listening for and we're being attentive to God who is always attending to us. This is really what prayer is. It's, it's a, a discipline of attending to God who always attends to us. And so we attend to God. And God gazes at us with infinite love. So we foster this practice of gazing at God who gazes at us with infinite love. And we begin to find our sense of identity, our at-homeness, in the fact that we are beloved. We are securely loved by God. As we foster this practice and we become more and more at home in being God's beloved, this is, we find ourselves like Adam and Eve before sin happened, <laughs> naked and unashamed. We can be who we are. We can drop the pretenses. We can be true and authentic. And in this space, we can notice what God is up to. God begins to show us what God is up to. <laughs> and we can cooperate with God. So we show up, we pay attention, we cooperate with God. We go where God is calling us. We stop doing that thing that God says stop doing. <laughs> we reach out and call that person that God keeps bringing to mind today. We do come and stand on this stage and tell the story that we weren't sure we should tell yesterday. <laughs> right? Show up, pay attention, cooperate with God, and then the fourth part of a contemplative stance, we release the outcome of our obedience. That word obedience troubles a lot of people today because it's been used to oppress many people, especially women, children, people of color, animals. <laughs> obedience has been used to oppress, to abuse, to do violence to, and to kill people. And so we're allergic to that word obedience because we think of it as violence. Violence that I have to subject myself to because I don't have power to stop it. But that word, it, it comes from a Latin word that means this, that means to listen to the point of action. To listen my way into behavior. So the fourth part of a contemplative stance as we are soaking in the fact that God loves us, we are beloved to God and we're beginning to notice God's activity. And we're beginning to take little steps of participating in and cooperating with God's activity. That's obedience, we're listening and we're, and we're acting now. And the fourth part of it is to release the outcome of that obedience. That's the hardest part for us. We wanna control the outcome. And it's a challenging part for us in institutions because institutions are systems and we have to have bottom lines and we have to have budgets and goals and this is, this is what we do, isn't it? <laughs> But it is possible to be an institutional leader and to be a contemplative. It is possible to lead an institution, 
whether it's the local church, the local food bank, the local annual conference, a school. We can be people who have that work to do, that God-given work, and do it in a contemplative stance. Do you believe that? Yes. Not only can we, that is the way we're supposed to do it, <laughs> to show up, to pay attention, cooperate with God and release the outcome of our obedience. That is so liberating. I'm not God after all. <laughs> Sometimes when we're obedient to God, we do the thing that God's inviting us to do. The lame will walk. <laughs> the blind will see. The hungry will be fed. And sometimes we'll be nailed to a cross. Blessing doesn't mean everything goes my way and it's all sunshine and smells like roses. Blessing means God is in me and with me and around me through it all. Amen. That's right. And nothing is wasted and nothing is lost. Because our God is risen from the dead. The God of redemption of making all things new. I think we should skip to the next slide. Okay, go to the next slide. That's, now I'm gonna shamelessly hawk this book. So, <laughs> this is what I'm talking about in this book. You can go to the next slide. <laughs> I'm gonna just skip past a couple of these slides. Okay, you can go to the next one. There we go. Go to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. A few thoughts. All right. So as we are helping our congregations transition, as we are helping them become anchor churches to the new things that God is calling forth, as we are helping our congregations be like that little Methodist church on a hill in Polzeth, Cornwall, here are a few thoughts that can help us. Organic is best. Look around. They didn't have a strategic plan. Those, those women looking out the window and wondering how to connect with surfer dudes, I'm not even sure they knew how to, they didn't know you're supposed to say dude. <laughs> they learned that along the way. This whole thing is like flying by the seat of your pants, as they say in flying small aircraft. Right? You're, you're figuring it out as you go. And so you have to cultivate an atmosphere of it's okay to fail as we learn how to do new things. 75% of what we learn in life, we learn through failure. If you're in the scientific world, of course you're gonna fail every day. You do experiments in order to find things out, right? So we need to be just kind of relaxed about doing some experiments. <laughs> it's okay. So organic, uh, pay attention to what is surfacing and coming toward us. What is coming toward us? How is God speaking to us through what is coming toward us? It's going to be specific to every context. Take all the time you need. Don't rush anything. Take the time you need to build relationships with people, real relationships. Take the time you need to do your good community organizing, asset-based community development. Find out what that is and do that. <laughs> uh, we're not doing this so that we can make a profit or we can shore up the program that started in 1957. That's not why we're doing this. We have to be very mindful of how that kind of thinking has distorted our missional imagination. We're not doing this to get stuff out of people, right? We're doing this so we can participate in God bringing love into the world and making all things new. We get to participate in that. That's how salvation happens. <laughs> That's why we're doing this. So take all the time we need. We don't have to be in a hurry. Let it be organic. Notice what God is calling forth. And if we will do this, if we will do this, and if we'll take, there, there's a question that surfaces every time I'm with people and we're talking about these things, a question surfaces. Well, wait a minute. If the church starts looking beyond itself and paying so much attention to other people that are outside the church, then the church will die. Who's gonna pay attention to us? Won't we die? 
wait a minute, if we're paying attention to the, to the surfer dudes, <laughs> won't we die? We won't be us anymore. Wait, if we pay attention to the, to the, to the biker people and we invest our resources and time and energy in them, we won't be us anymore. I just have one question, who is us? Is that the us that Jesus had in mind when he died on the cross? Is that what Jesus had in mind? Is that even what John Wesley had in mind? <laughs> Little uptight John Wesley who was the father of our movement. God calls the oddest people to do these things. He was about my size, only probably skinnier and just really liked to make lists of things. <laughs> you see, if we will practice a contemplative stance, if we, will, if we will pray, if we will foster this kind of prayer, this kind of stance in the world that I, that I talked about a moment ago, our identity will be in Christ, not in the wineskin. Our usness will be in our Christ community, the beloved community. And we'll be so flexible, it'll, it'll just be so flexible. We can just go where God wants us to go, we can stay where God wants us to stay, it's gonna be all right, it's fine. That's what we need today. <laughs> That's why God is doing this new thing. <laughs> I wanna be part of it, don't you? Yes. Amen. Well, I think I've run out of time. I don't even know what time it is. Is it, are we out of time, Bishop? Uh, you're good. We're good? Okay. All right, we're going to pray now. How's that sound? All right. Everybody who's able, let's stand. We're going to pray with our hands open like this. We're even going to pray with our eyes open. <laughs> Did you know that's allowed? <laughs> God who loves us more than we can possibly know. We pray that you would guide us beyond all our fears. <laughs> guide us through them. Guide us to healing, to new life. Guide us into the way of praying that places us right in front of you, gazing into your eyes as you gaze at us with infinite love. Help us to turn away from our anxious clutching and curving in upon ourselves. Help us to relax in your care, to just lean back into your care. And to hear what you're saying and see what you're doing and say, all right, I'm there with you <laughs> and go with you. <laughs> We pray for a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit in this conference. Come and mess us up. Just get us over ourselves for Pete's sake. We're so uptight and anxious and full of little tiny ideas. We are ready for a new day. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.